So we are live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. So you can start. Okay. So welcome everyone to this, uh, you know, and learn online webinar. So this is uh, on basic science and uh, thanks to IOA for giving this, uh, you know, the go ahead to go you know, all across the country and, and beyond. So today we have amongst us, uh, uh, Dr. Ram Chadda, who doesn't need uh, introduction. So he has been the president of uh, Association of Spine Surgeons of India, as well as uh, president of Indian Orthopedic Association. And uh, he has been a prolific spine surgeon who started career in Mumbai, in Nilavati and many other top hospitals. So, and he's in Taiwan, by the way, today, uh, and going to give a lecture for the, the spine surgeons in Taiwan, which is a very prestigious lecture. So with uh, not spending much time, because he really doesn't need any introduction, I'm sure. So, sir, please, over to you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Baskar. Um, on behalf of the Indian Orthopedic Association and our president, Dr. Atul Srivastav, I welcome each one of you for the uh, Basic Science Subcommittee uh, webinar. Uh, we have a committee which includes brilliant people, three of whom are in front of you. That's Dr. Anand Thakur, Dr. Samarth Mithil, Dr. Baskar Vargoin. Uh, Madam Shobatha uh, Arora is uh, uh, not physically present with us right now but she has uh, sent her blessings and her good wishes for this event. And it is an integral part of our training and our daily practice that basic sciences should be learned, relearned, and repeatedly relearned because that is where we actually gain our knowledge. Biology and mechanics are <coughs> our subspeciality, and it's extremely important how we look at these two aspects. We have none other than Professor Dr. A.J. Thakur, a very, very senior respected teacher of ours, past president of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, who is with us. And I feel humbled that we are all here in his presence and what will be a very, very educational, intriguing, informing, and inspiring presentation. So I look forward to, sir, and over to you back, Bhaskar, to introduce sir and take the proceedings ahead. All the best. Thank you so much, sir, for spending your time with us. So thank you very much. Uh, so now as you all heard, uh, Dr. Professor Anand Akur, sir, is going to, you know, he also doesn't need any introduction. He has been a veteran in the field. And uh, he has uh, not only been uh, you know, outstanding surgeon, but uh, his interest lies in basic science. As we know, like in, in you know, in uh, molecular genetics, the DNA is the basis of the pyramid. And you take out DNA, the entire molecular medicine collapses in one second. So I think basic science is such important because based on this, we are going to understand. And the very first thing in orthopedics, which is like a bread and butter is fracture. And fracture healing is you know, the very basic of the pyramid that holds everything. So today, uh, Dr. Anand is going to speak on mechanobiological aspects of fracture healing, where I'm sure he's going to touch all the important, you know, the biomechanical, how the mechanical cues and mechanical stimulus, uh, you know, converts to, you know, cellular signal that converts the fracture healing unit, as we have seen how it's going to, you know, uh, uh, the basic understanding based on which we'll have a clinical translation. So with these words, uh, over to sir, Anand sir, and we are eagerly waiting to you know, listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Bhaskar and Rab for introducing me. <clears throat> it's always a pleasure to talk to orthopedic surgeons, especially to the postgraduates about basic sciences. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> I'll simply share my screen so that everybody can see what is happening. Okay. 
The topic today is the mechanobiologic aspect of the fracture healing and also of failure. To briefly talk about myself, I would say my books are my introduction. This uh, book has been useful to a lot of orthopedic surgeons for the last 25 years. And uh, uh, it has got a lot of content about basic sciences. And based on this only, I'm going to talk to you. My other book is uh, on locking plate, which is comprehensive information about this particular subject. The third book is of day-to-day -day use in which I have given positions and the tricks of using x-rays on day-to-day -day life in our uh, clinical practice. My passion for uh, pre good presentation has led me to write a small book on PowerPoint. Uh, which mainly gives you how to improve your presentation uh, and make it excellent stand out everywhere. Recently, I have modified this book for use of uh, Asian subcontinent. With that, I would say, why should we study basic sciences? In medical college, we study anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, pathology. And by the time we pass out and come to orthopedics, the details are forgotten, but the framework of knowledge remains as a background to develop intuition that is required in working in medicine all the time. Besides, it gives us vocabulary, which is uh, of use in reading literature, in communicating with each other, understanding each other, and progressing on that side. So, Basic knowledge, basic science is absolutely essential. I introduce the word mechanic biology. Uh, what is mechanobiology? By definition, it says it's, it's physical, it is study of physical forces working on a cell. Extra pressure or extra moment in the vicinity of the cell would alter its function. And that is what mechanobiology. Uh, studies. A cell, a pluripotent cell in a fractured tissue would produce fibrosis if there is a lot of movement. If the movement is reduced, the same tissue, same cell will now produce osteoblasts. So this is only because of change in the mechanical atmosphere around that fracture site. This study is, that's why important and mechanobiology is that thing. Well, biomechanics is study of the joints and muscles and instruction, how they move, what are the pressures, what are on their surfaces, etc. So there's a difference. Mechanobiology we should study because it will give us all the information on being with a lot of subjects of our interest. Today my focus is going to be on, on callus. Callus is an important thing in fracture healing. The Latin word callum means scar tissue. And we're going to study callus from mechanical point of view and see the effects, uh, a mechanical point of view, how it helps in uh, achieving the final result of fracture healing. This is the first half. In the second half, I'm going to discuss how various treatment modes affect callus formation. So we start with uh, four stages of fracture healing. Initially, there is a hematoma, a hemorrhage, and that becomes a hematoma. With hem hematoma, then gets organized, and there's the granulation tissue around, which later on is transformed to fibrous tissue. Fibrous tissue develops cartilages, and that cartilage later on becomes calcified, and thus we have fracture healing. So these are the three steps. Once the fracture, the calcification occurs in the callus, the moment start and patient uh, forgets about the fracture because he is able to use the limb. However, the healing process continues and the fourth important stage is of uh, remodeling. Remodeling doesn't uh, describe exactly what's happening. There are various synonyms for uh, the remodeling, like recreate, reasonable, remake, recast, but my favorite is restoration. Restoration to the original shape. That is what the final stage does. 
which is popularly known as remodeling. It means that the final stage or the end of fracture healing is when the, the bone regains its original shape. Uh, in other words, the callus would gradually disappear and the bone will be reinstated. Bone is the only tissue in the body that replaces itself with original tissue. There is no scar tissue in bone healing. In fracture, never heals with the scar with the original bone. This diagram tells us about the, the uh, general organization of fracture healing process. We have cells on a scaphoid and the growth factors. These three together make the biological aspect of bone healing, and we can level them as bone healing unit. Now, this bone healing unit requires stability to work. Uh, imagine there is a uh, there is a uh, anyway. If it is not stable, things will not grow. One cannot construct a building if there is an earthquake going on. You require stable ground. Similarly, uh, we require stable area in the, in the fracture zone, then the healing will take place. Now, this has been explained by a theory by Perrin, who says that tissue cannot grow under conditions where strain at the fracture side exceeds the elongation limit of the tissue. Strain means deformation. Deformation means movement at the fracture side. And elongate, the soft tissue will be elongated with movement. If it is elongated too much, it will break. So what Perrin says that if the movement is of a greater degree where the soft tissue will break, then the fracture will not heal, which is simple to understand. So with that, we say that a ori tissue has a limit where it will break. How much it can be stretched before it breaks is called the rupture, elongation of at rupture. And this is expressed as percentage of the original length. So there are no units. We just expect that it is elongation at rupture is 40%. Importance will come to know gradually. As it elongates, the tissue becomes stiff. The, this stiff helps in reducing the movement. Stiffness reduces the movement at the fracture side, which is essential. And the, the stiffness increases suddenly. It doesn't go gradually, it increases suddenly. And this is called a non-linear. The increasing elongation, the stiffness of a connective increases in non-linear way. Linear way is the gradual. This is the linear way of uh, linear progression. Slowly it rises. But the tissue stiffness suddenly rises halfway, and when it reaches the peak, it, it will break at the specified point. Well, these are the five important tissues that are involved in the fracture healing, and we will just see how much they can tolerate elongation. Hematoma is just fluid, and it has no elongation limit. It doesn't have no strength at all. But when it is converted to granulation, granulation tissue by action of the uh, cells, then it can be elongated almost double its size. It can be elongated 100% and uh, that is what it is. The, the, the granulation tissue is then converted to fibrous tissue. It becomes stiffer and breaks early. Only it can be stretched for 60% but it is much stronger than the granulation tissue. Later on, the fibrous tissue is converted to, uh, into cartilaginous tissue, and it even becomes stronger, stiffer, and it, but it will rupture only at 40% of the elongation, but it is much stiffer than the fibrous tissue. <clears throat> when calcification occurs in the fibrocartilage, we call it callus. Now, callus is like a rubber. It's like a rubber net. It is strong and pliable. It doesn't break easily. It may be stretched also adequately. And that stretch limit is about 10%. Bone is like glass. It is strong, stiff, but brittle. It will break when it is stretched even as less as 2%. <clears throat> 
soft tissue is turning stiffer and less stretchable as the healing process uh, progresses. The soft tissue, which is just hematoma, gradually becomes fibrous tissue, fibrocartilages, and callus. So it becomes stiffer and less stretchable. As I said, 100% in granulation tissue stretchability, bone can be stretched only 2%. So that is the way the nature reduces movement at the fracture right. In connection with callus, we always say that it is woven and spatial in distribution. So what is this woven? If I had to describe this structure, then I would say that this central rod is surrounded by a material which is woven in fabrication and spatial in distribution. That means you can see the weaving pattern and the material is all around the uh, pole. So it is covering in all sides. So this is woven and spatial in distribution. If you see a callus under the microscope, something like this is seen where you can see the crisscrossing fibers and also the mature cells underneath. Woven and spatial is an important term. It doesn't break easily. If you take a spring and compress it or stretch it, it changes, but it doesn't break. One considers one particular ring of that uh, spring, then nothing much happens at one spot. That is the reason the, spray, the callus does not break easily. It is quite tenacious and is useful. Uh, if we now consider a mechanical point of view of the healing process, we, when the, there is excessive load on the fracture, it breaks and there is loss of function. Uh, because of pain, the muscles go in spasm and it minimizes the movement at the fracture site. After the fracture, there is hemorrhage and hematoma. Hematoma later on granula, uh, becomes solidified, is turned into granulation tissue. The granulation tissue has a, a stretchability, so it allows, but still it's stiff. So it, it uh, tends to decrease the movements along the fracture uh, tissue. In a few weeks following the fracture, uh, the tissue modification reduces the fracture mobility and increases the tissue stiffness by a factor to the power of 10. As the granulation tissue is converted to fibrous tissue, the movement decreases considerably. <clears throat> Later on, the fibrocartilage develops and the calcification occurs, so the movement really goes down very, very fast. And what we, then we call it is callus. Callus is very likable, laudable. We all want to see callus when we are treating fracture because we know that is the beginning of the healing process. And patient also feels that he can use the limb as an required. Mechanically, what is happening in the palace is that the diameter of the fracture zone has increased and that makes it stronger against axial and bending loads. When before the fracture or just after the fracture, the diameter of the bone is only this much. But when the hematoma organizes and later on becomes a callus, the diameter is increased. Because of this bigger diameter, the fracture site has become stronger than the bone itself. And this is described as polar and area movement of inertia. Increased surfer, circumference makes the fracture site stronger, even stronger than the bone itself. <laughs> to explain this, these two terms, uh, a, a circular object, uh, and a larger circular object. So the if torque is applied, then the larger circular object will withstand more rotational or twisting force than compared to the smaller circular object. Similarly, if it's a, a bar or there, then a bar of four millimeters will be weaker than a bar of seven millimeters when bending load is applied to that. 
I guess small here is a representation of infra a bone which is immediately after the fracture. And if you apply a bending load, there, there will be a lot of uh, displacement. As the callus occurs, there will be increase in the diameter at the fracture site. And now if we apply a bending load, then the displacement will be much less. So this is still because of the larger area of movement of inertia at the fracture site. In simple terms, what it means is that if the diameter is much larger, the, the area would be stronger. The junction, the fracture junction would be much stronger than the bone itself. And it will withstand the rotational force, that is the polar, or the bending force, that is the area movement of inertia. These terms are technical terms, but the engineers use it, and it's worth knowing that. It gives us an idea how things are happening in nature. <coughs> if we see the, the thing happening, that it is reducing the movement at the fracture site at every stage, from hematoma to granulation to fibrous tissue to cartilage. At every stage, the uh, nature's attempt is to reduce the movement at the fracture site so that the healing takes place. And there we are, what is I say? When it comes to the bone area, the when the when there is bone formation or a strong calcified callus formation, the impact of the fracture on the patient is lost. He is able to use the limb so he feels things are over. But the end heal point of the healing is complete remodeling which goes on for a very long time without patient realizing it. Uh, here you see there is a big callus, a calcification scene, um, a calcified callus scene, which gradually decreases in size and ultimately disappears. The callus disperses itself as the healing takes place. Ultimately, two bone ends join together with the original bone tissue without leaving a scar. That is the final healing, which takes a long time after the fracture. The patient is started using his uh, limb actively. So that is the complete story of bone healing. Callus is a transient tissue. But the final goal is to reshuffling. It just helps in getting the thing together, uh, making it there so that the healing can occur by direct progression from one end to other and the medullary cavity can be opened. Though it is called callus, there is no scar tissue and the bone segment remains uh, uh, as normal as before the fracture uh, there. There are three articles I would like to recommend for further reading, these two and the one here. Uh, these are fairly detailed about whatever I just spoken to you. But all these have been condensed and simplified in this book. So all the four readings are useful. Recently, I have found this article, which is very informative about the careless formation. So those interested they should read this. It's a very, very well written article from a very, very uh, prestigious place. So, in this, we come to the second part that the fracture treatment aims at callus formation every time that we do this. Any type of fracture treatment reduces movement at the fracture side. That means it creates stability. It could be relative or absolute stability. Our, when we use a splint or a plaster, we produce relative stability. When we operate and use an intramedullary device or an external fixator or lock plate, we, can, we produce or we aim to produce relative stability. There are situations where we want to use absolute stability for healing then we use compression techniques and produce uh, such a stable fracture fixation that movement is very little or nothing. <clears throat> so 
this this is the basis of treating before any surgeon starts treating he has to decide what type of healing he wants in that particular fracture if he is aiming at uh, at a relative stability then he can use one of those i have mentioned but if he deems that absolute stability is required then he has to use different methods different implants and different protocols non operative treatments always produce abundant caution abundant callus this is a child's bone which was simply splintered you can see there is abundant callus here there is mal union or mal reduction but that's different but the amount of callus is enormous because the stability in a splint was reduced to between 2 to 10% and the movement continued till the the hematoma calcified so the abundant callus is happening there similarly in cast when you put plasters you produce only relative stability and the fractures will heal with callus when we take up internal fixation we can use our methods in such a way that we get secondary healing with callus formation or primary healing without callus formation choice is ours we can take this way or that way whatever we want we will do that so we may choose methods and implants which will either facilitate callus formation or we bypass callus formation and aim for remodeling straight by producing absolute stability let's take an example now what i'm saying that surgeon is the master of creating mechanical environment with his knowledge he decides that this particular fracture requires absolute stability then he will use the techniques and the instruments and implants to produce that stability he can do that when he decides that he wants relative stability he wants to see callus so the fracture heals early and patient is mobilized then he uses a different method different implant and produces that surgeon knows what to do that here is on the red arrow shows and production of absolute stability a lax screw through a plate produces absolute stability zero movement at the fracture site fracture has healed without throwing any callus direct healing that fixation has produced a vicarious stability in the fibula which was not tackled at all but it was stabilized to a good extent between, so that the stability was between 2 and 10% movement and it threw abundant callus so in one x ray you can see the two different production lines <clears throat> if we consider causes of non union mechanical failure is highest cause of fail a non union creating mechanical environment for fracture is surgeon's responsibility knowing the implants and knowing the uh, biomechanics of them knowing their basic uh, tenets and knowing their basic drawbacks a surgeon should be able to create required mechanical environment for that particular fracture let's see a uh, transverse fracture of humerus in an elderly patient uh, this was treated with a long plane bent at the fracture site and uh, maximum number of uh, standard cortical screws were used but only end screws were locking to produce the stability so it did not give a very very high level of stability but just adequate enough so there was little movement and you can see callus formation at the fracture site fracture healed very satisfactorily uh, one couldn't have gone for the absolute stability because the quality of bone was not as good as one blood this lady was about 70 year old so it was not but the aim so decided to go for the relative stability and was achieved like this but in a young person the same technique same plates and compression was applied using a compression device 
and absolute stability was produced. You cannot see a spot where the fracture was in 14 months. Everything has been remodeled. By producing the compression stability of very high degree, we send the message to the bone forming unit that there is no need to go for callus formation. They can proceed for direct healing from end to end, from cortex to cortex, and middle canal can be recanalized as early as possible. Body is quite sensitive to mechanical environments, which can be seen here. Now, when you see uh, the, uh, the stability was so high that the and reduction was perfect, so that the creeping substitution from one end to the other started almost immediately and primary healing was achieved in this case. Who else can we blame except for the surgeon? He has used a very short plate. That too, the length has not been fully utilized. Length of an applied plate is only from the last screw on either side of the fracture. The, if you, the, last screw, the terminal screws on both sides of the fracture have not been utilized. That means those plate does not exist there. Functionally, the plate exists between the top screw and the bottom screw. That's all. If you take that measure for this kind of fracture, this is a very short plate, and the screws are also cortical. Uh, so inadequate stability was there, was mechanical failure, and no wonder that it went to non-union. This is not understanding the need for higher level of stability to achieve fixation. In lower limbs, usually we go for intermediary nailing, but in this particular, the plate was utilized. A heavy duty stainless steel plate was used with this device. It produced adequate stability and there was excellent amount of callus formation. <clears throat> Not only that, there was a periosteal callus formation, there was also industrial callus formation. And later on, there was direct callus formation. Healing also occurred later. You can see all the three types of healing because the stability was very suitable to start with. It was relative stability. When the industrial and periosteal calluses were formed, it reached the absolute stability then direct cortical healing started because the reduction was anatomical. <clears throat> At 22 months, you can see that the set started remodeling. There's a small point I want to make about this particular implant, 95 degrees uh, blade plate. Uh, this is a DCS screw, 95 degrees, but the 95 degrees blade plate is also coming back. A lot of people are talking about it. The important point is that the screw, the cortical screw must engage the opposite cortex. If the proximal fragment is so short that you cannot use the second screw, then the implant will not work. 95 degrees blade plate or DCS will work only if the cortical screw has a good hold in the opposite cortex, then only it works. <clears throat> The, this is a condition, metadiaphyseal fracture. A long plate has been used and adequate spacing has been given. So he will have a good healing in good time. However, there is an issue here. At the top, if you see, <clears throat> the last screw has been left empty. So as I said, the length of the plate is only till the last screw. The extra length which has been used to overlap the stem of the implant in the hip is not functional. So in practice, we have a stress riser below the stem and it is predicted that the patient will have a stress fracture in short time. What should have been done that the last screw, the why should a locking screw uh, with a unicortical hole should have been placed there, that would have extended the length of the plate and the overlap would have occurred. 
So this is a dicey situation and one expects it will fracture at the, at the, at the topmost screw below the stem, it should fracture sometime later. <clears throat> when the combination is so much, it is expected that just a lateral plate may not be giving adequate stability. So an additional plate could be used to get the adequate required stability and this has been achieved a reasonable amount in a reasonable amount of time good healing had occurred <clears throat> so you can situation there in the same fracture you require secondary and primary healing primary healing for the cortical area and secondary healing for the metadiaphyseal area the screws distally are lax screws and they are producing absolute stability for the cortical area and the plate is giving stability uh, or relative stability for the uh, diaphyseal, metaphyseal fractures. But this plate has problem, even in perfect reduction of restrict placement of the screw, still adequate callus doesn't form. There are various reasons. So to overcome that, what could be done? There has been research and we have this flexible screw, what are also known as for far cortex locking screw. When this screw has a hold in the plate and also on the distal fragment, but no hold in the proximal uh, cortex. When loaded, it will bend and the both the, cord, the proximal and distal cortex will move equally well. Which can see here, the movement induced by this uh, far, far cortex locking is that is parallel and exaggerated movement proximal and distal fragment. So with this good amount of callus is formed. This is the picture of a, a far cortex locking screw. One model which has been crossed has been discontinued, but the other one, the number B model is still available for consumption. There are examples where this technique has been used and one can see uh, adequate amount of fracture. The problem with uh, far cortex locking screw that it does not work in short screws. So what do we do? We invent another plate called active plate. It's a piece of metal which is enclosed in silastic uh, sheath and that is put in a slot inside the plate. This then becomes uh, the uh, hole and the plate uh, looks like this, but one can use it as a locking plate and it gives uh, movement. It enhances callus formation at diaphyseal sides by symmetrical dynamic axial dynamization. Stimulates circumferential callus and yields faster and stronger healing than standard locking plates. <coughs> This is the animal model, but you can see under the green arrow, uh, the circumferential callus, while the standard locking plates, only far cortex is showing the callus formation. This is a human humerus uh, in which this plate has been used and in 24 weeks since abundant callus at the fracture side. Also the length of the fracture, uh, length of the plate is much smaller than we, locking plate that could be used there. Because all these screws are locking with the special uh, active plate, there are a lot of movement and you get good callus. A third plate <laughs> has been uh, invented, it's called biphasic plate. A thicker plate is taken and a, a slot is made in that. So it gives the flexibility to the uh, new plate. And this is very cleverly incorporated in this S-shaped uh, thing. And this plate is applied as a lateral cortex plate, which then produces a very high degree of fracture. I don't have a clinical picture for this. This is under still experimental condition, but one expects good results from this, what do you think? <clears throat> we can, the mechanical causes are in, uh, in um, nailing also. In this case, there is adic inadequate number of locking plates. It permits toggling at both ends. There is torsional forces introduced. So it's a weak, the weak fixation, which is giving rise to instability at the fracture site. 
and non-union issues. <clears throat> this is because when there is parallel locking, there is toggle there. The, the nail can move sideways with this. With the toggle, the excess, axial moment is not affected, but the torsion that introduces introduced because of the, uh, the oscillating movement, because of the toggle, produces torsion, and torsion destroys the, uh, the callus formation. There's a torsion here, and the shear force ensures this. Shear force is of two types, horizontal and oblique. When the oblique one is more devastating, it destroys that. So there was a mechanical air, poor fixation on either side. So shear motion in the fracture side caused non-union. To get over it, one could either do exchange nailing or there is a new method. All you got to do is to improve uh, the stability at the fracture side. And if the screws are passed by percutaneous method, adequate stability could be used. Here is an example uh, how just by passing three screws, adequate stability and union was achieved. So it is a question of understanding the mechanical situation, environment at the fracture site, and the surgeon should endeavor in one way or the other to create stability of a higher level so that healing can progress satisfactorily and to completion. This is called strain reduction screw, and this article is very good and very useful. One should read in that. So with that, I would say, uh, Mechanical environment is very important and very useful. A surgeon should understand what is the requirement of a fracture and should strive to create mechanical situation at the fracture side, which will achieve healing in shortest possible time for the patient. With this, I conclude this talk and I would be happy to answer any questions coming from the audience. So, thank you very much, sir, for your you know wonderful you know presentation and elucidation and explanation of some of the very crucial and basic uh, points. While you know the treating and doing osteosynthesis in various fractures, looking into the biomechanical and mechanobiology. So I, I would uh, request uh, the, you know, the participants, if there is any questions and I, uh, Samarth, we can get, uh, you know, question from the participants. Uh, beyond the Yes, technology. sir, I'm getting them, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting People ask why we should study biosciences. Why should we study basic sciences? To it's more to understand or develop a language or words or vocabulary. Increasing. There's an interesting story about uh, Einstein. He was invited to a ladies' club for a for a dinner uh, for a tea party. And the, there are lots of society ladies who wanted to know what is the theory of relativity. So the hostess asked, uh, asked Einstein, could you explain to us uh, very simply what is your theory of relativity? So Einstein got us and said, yes, I will explain to you, but first that I will tell you a story. And he said, once I was walking along with, my, with a friend who is blind and we were walking around the river. It's a very hot day. And I said to my friend, it's very hot. It would be good if I could get a glass of milk. So the blind fellow asked Einstein, I know what is a glass, but what is milk? You explained to me. So I said, milk is a white fluid. So the blind man says, what is white? She said, white 
is like the color of the feathers of a swan. The blind man says, I know feathers, but what is swan? So Einstein says, swan is a bird with a crooked neck. So again, the blind man says, I know a bird, but what is crooked? So Einstein gets his arm, makes his elbow, straightens his up and says, this is straight. And then he bends it and says, this is crooked. And he, <laughs> the moral of the story is that in, there are so many technical words. So if we don't know what is compression, what is tension, then you have to explain it all the time. Where do we learn tension, compression, or uh, callus, or pluripotent cells, or glucose? In these words, where do we learn? We learn from the basic sciences. So unless we know the basic sciences, we cannot progress in medicine. We cannot progress in orthopedics. That's why we should all have, understand what the basic sciences and we should have more talk on medical sciences for our orthopedic surgeons, particularly for our postgraduate students. Wonderful, sir. I yeah. think there is a question coming. Uh, yeah. Is there any innovation to enhance callus formation in nailing situation? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I, will, I will share my... I have to share my... This thing again. Yes. Oh. You have to go back to the slide where I think. You're okay. Ah, uh, see in nailing. <coughs> At fracture side, the axial movement is not affected by toggle. I just showed you the, if there are parallel screws, the toggle occurs. But with the toggle, axial movement is not affected, but it introduces torsion and torsion introduces shear. Shear is detrimental to the fracture side. So to get rid of this torsion or the shear, the more research was done. Distortion introduces shear, and that is what it destroys. So, on removing free play at the nail screw junction to provide enhanced torsional stiffness. So, we have multi angles. This multi angle locking eliminates torsion and shear. So, but it also reduces axial motion, which is detrimental to bone healing. Torsion and shear is eliminated, which is very good, but it also reduces the axial motion. So there is poor callus formation. Now this technology is used by all these three uh, nails. Um, these nail, these companies, they all have this kind of this. So many times the calcium, there is not adequate axial movement at the fracture side. So how to get over this thing was this. You must do something that the tor the torsion is gone, but the axial moment should increase. Research tells us that if you have a fixation in which you allow moderate amount of axial movement, but eliminate the torsion or torque, then you will get abundant callus. There's high shear stiffness and moderate axial stiffness will produce strong callus as compared to a construct with both high shear and high axial stiffness. So this thought process led to innovation to get a device which will fully box torsion motion but allow moderate axial thing. So what was done was the upper end of the nail here, the hole, the locking hole was enlarged and a small insert was made uh, with this. And in this insert, a bushing was played. The bushing had this special slot and the insert also had a special slot so that they don't rotate against each other. The same technology is used in DHS screw. It has got a flat surface on two sides. So the plate doesn't rotate there. 
it, it holds there. So same thing, slots on either side so that the uh, rotational moment is eliminated and there is kind of lock. The whole assembly is then introduced inside the, the insert the insert and the bushing have, as I said, they eliminate the counter rotation of the two feet. The whole assembly is inserted inside the upper end of the nail. And then you have an enlarged dynamization slot with the insert in the bushing. <coughs> this the slot is five millimeters. One introduces a four millimeter screw. So there is a mismatch of one millimeter and that allows axial movement. It eliminates the torque completely, but allows axial movement. And the findings are that decreases tor torsional mobility by 14%, but increases axial motion by 22% creates mechanical environment and fears interferometal motion. There was a less will issue. This nail is in market. You can see these two examples. It is for proximal femur as well as for the upper end of tibia. It produces robust scalus. I don't have a picture for the proximal femur, but this is the tibial picture. It is available as apex tibial nail uh, made in Ireland, but it is available commercially only in the United States. They are not selling it in Europe or any other part of the country. And these uh, pictures are given to me by Hannah Daly, who is the main innovator for this kind of this. And she is very optimistic that the nail is, uh, is very useful and hoping that it popularizes with the surgeon. Axial nail, and this is the innovation which is doing the articles. Initially, it was presented as named by acronym Fast Nail, but now it is marketed as Apex TBL Nail. <clears throat> so, this is the innovation which is the latest in nail technology and uh, is available in America, but is unfortunately not available in other parts. Hopefully, in a couple of years. It will be open for the whole world to use it. Let's see. Thank you, Ajay sir. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, but I think uh, they came in through your talk and most of those you have already answered uh, uh, with uh, the beautiful slides that you have shown and the details that you have talked about uh, uh, of the uh, biomechanical healing. Uh, so uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I would like to thank Dr. A.J. Thakur, sir, uh, the IOA Basic Science Committee, uh, the president of IOA, Dr. Atul Shivasta, who couldn't uh, be here because he's traveling uh, out of country today. I thank, especially would like to thank Dr. Uh, Ram Chadda, who is the vice president of IOA for making it uh, to this webinar, uh, despite him being abroad in Taiwan and presenting an oration to the uh, Taiwan Orthopedic Association uh, tomorrow. And it's quite late in the night for him. Special thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Bhaskar for moderating this session. Dr. Bhaskar, if you have something to further to add. No, thank you so much, Samarth, for your you know initiative to start this uh, basic science uh, learning program, which is going to go a long way in you know learning and unlearning and relearning, particularly for the post visit as well as for the seniors. So I thank you for taking this initiative, and uh, I thank. Uh, Dr. Thakur for you know for a wonderful you know talk uh, encompassing almost everything on fracture healing. Thank you, thank you, Professor Baskar, and thank you so much. Uh, I am enjoyed talking and preparing for this lecture. I hope we have more sessions uh, with more people talking on this committee. Thank yeah. you, thank you, sir. and thank, thank you, you so for much. all the thank all you. the delegates who have joined online to you know who are the you know main should be the main benefactor, you know. And uh, although we are all stakeholders because you want, you know, a very, you know, equitably distributed skill across the country so that we can give, you know, very uniform care across the country. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Saman. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Poonam, if you could just stop the telecast. Yeah, thank you, Poonam, for all the backup. Yeah.
special thanks to dr neeraj bijlani for arranging this on ortho tv and ioa tv to be telecasted to all the delegates okay. all right thank you has punam stopped or not yet no no she hasn't sir okay or shall we just leave or we want to i think we can all log out sir all right bye thank you thank, thank you, you. Good night, thank everyone. you bye have a good night